Lord, your presence is in this place, Father. We just pray for your Holy Spirit to fall in a mighty way, God. We are here for one reason, and that's for you only, Lord. May our, our praise just rise up as incense to your throne. Father, I pray that the distractions of the day or anything that we're going through, we just leave at the altar tonight. And Lord, that as we sing these worship songs, Father, that you would be placed in your rightful place in heaven, where all the angels are gathered around your throne, worshiping you now. Father, we just join with them. And Lord, we want to see you magnified, glorified, um, raised up high. And, and we're here, Lord, and we need your Holy Spirit to do that. So we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay.
stop it going on. And if he's for us, he could be against us. Amen. Amen. new song for tonight. It's called Such an Awesome God. Words are such an awesome God. There's nothing else we can say to that. That's the highest praise we can give him. He is so awesome.
His mercy.
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please greet one another tonight. In the name of the Lord. Okay, let's go tight on Pastor Richard. Okay, uh, move this out of the way. Oh, you just grab it and move it. You just click down and then hold it. Don't let it go. So I click down and I hold it. You know. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then hit Bible there. Alright. And then that's all that we And that's it. Good evening. God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, please open them with me to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Continuing our study on Wednesday nights through the book of Proverbs. And uh, we've just got four left. Tonight we'll be looking at Proverbs 28. Let me pray one more time and just ask God to speak to us from His Word. Father, we thank You just for the privilege of coming together as Your people. We thank You, God, for the blessing of Your Holy Spirit that meets us when we unify our hearts toward You in worship and praise and thanksgiving. We believe You are so among us. We pray that you would now speak to us from your word, Lord, as we open our hearts to hear from you. God speak, we ask by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 28. Let's jump right in. Verse 1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know, sin often leads to fear and anxiety and worry. It's accompanied with the guilty heart, the, the conscience that's violated. The wicked flee even when no one is pursuing. They're just anxious. They're fearful. But there's a, there's a boldness. There's a confidence for those that are in the Lord. Romans 8 says there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. That should give you a, a comfort, a boldness in your standing with the Lord and a confidence in Him. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and of a sound mind. See, the wicked are fleeing when, when no one pursues. They're just imagining fear, they're looking over their shoulder. But the righteous have a confidence and a boldness. Paul goes on to Timothy in, in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, there, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. That is in Christ Jesus. I pray that for your heart tonight. That you would not be looking over your shoulder, worried and fearful, but that you would be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus. Bold as lions, confident, because God is with you and for you. Verse 2 Because of the transgression of the land, many are its princes, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, right will be prolonged. It seems that the thought here is that as the land begins to transgress, uh, there needs to be more princes, more government is required uh, to manage the transgression of the land. But uh, godly leadership, man of understanding and knowledge, uh, right is prolonged. I wonder how big our government is going to get before, uh, before transgression of the land begins to be contained, maybe never. Verse 3, a poor man who oppresses the poor is like a driving rain which leaves no food. Normally rain is a good thing, but when rain comes that's so hard driving that it actually is destructive, and so that's the analogy here of a poor man who should be helping his fellow poor, but rather he oppresses the poor, does further damage. You know, I was thinking just about... Um, God's people and, and shepherding God's people. When a poor man oppresses the poor, I was thinking, you know, someone who should be bringing help, someone who should be doing good. Such a, a strong word of warning for those that have spiritual. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. 
God, help us to help others. Help us to be good examples. Help us... the kids.
they already know the, how that ends. They know where that, that leads. And yet now, instead of listening to me, they refuse to listen to me. They're chasing after these false gods. In verse 11, therefore thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Again, a sowing and reaping. There is a time when a heart becomes so hard, so refusing to listen, that um, God then has to send discipline, judgment, and then it's too late. Oh, they want to cry out to God then, but it's too late. They're already now under the consequence of their own hard, stubborn choices. So, you know, we often say it's never too late, and for a sincere heart, I want to tell you, it is never too late. Even that thief on the cross who was there in his last moments, crucified next to Jesus, he cried out to Jesus, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So it's never too late for the sincere heart, but this is talking about the hard heart. This is, a, this is someone who's wanting to pray for their own selfish, uh, fearful moment, not a sincere heart. And this is often the case. People pray uh, and, then, and then they get through the situation and they go right back to their old ways. They, it wasn't a real repentance. It wasn't a turning to God. It was rather just wanting God to help them selfishly escape consequence, things going on in their life. So I think you understand. The scriptures speak against that stubborn hardness, refusing to hear, but always encourage as a sincere, humble turning to the Lord. Verse 10 Whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he himself will fall into his own pit, but the blameless will inherit good. When you're setting traps to stumble others, you yourself will stumble. And such a warning here in the Scripture, not to, not to cause uh, the upright to go astray. We think of the words of Jesus, pretty strong words. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Pretty harsh words from Jesus. A millstone was a big, giant stone used to grind grain. Better to be have one of those and tossed into the sea than um, what you're going to receive for causing uh, a faithful little one who believes in me to sin. That's Matthew 18, 6. Just a warning that we are not to cause others to sin, especially those that are upright, especially those that are sincere. Verse 11, the rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding searches him out. Proverbs 28, 11 in the NIV reads this way, the rich are wise in their own eyes. One who is poor and discerning sees how deluded they are. Isn't it interesting that how some very wealthy and famous individuals imagine themselves to be very wise? Maybe you've noticed that in our culture. I was here last night catching some of the last bit of the Romans class here at the school, and Pastor Brian was commenting on that, saying, you know, just because somebody can uh, hit a baseball, dunk a basketball, we, we, the whole world follows after their wisdom, right? Wow, he must know what he's doing. Look how, what a good athlete he is. She must know, look what a great movie star she is. Uh, wow, he's so wealthy. He must have all the answers. The rich are wise in their own eyes. But the poor who has understanding searches him out, sees how deluded they are. Money and fame don't make wise. Movie stars, sports stars, popular people, they may be influencers, they are influencers in our culture, but those who have discernment can see through it, you can see, you know, that's empty. I know they mean well, I know they, they imagine they have something to say and they're their platform has given them, their, light, their skill, their, their wealth has given them a platform to say what they espouse as wisdom, but uh, real discernment can see that that is not, that's not, those things are meant oftentimes not wise. Verse 12, when the righteous rejoice, there is great glory, but when the wicked arise, 
men hide themselves. Thinking of Joseph when he had to flee with baby Jesus to Egypt. Remember Herod killing all the infants near Bethlehem looking for, to put the baby Jesus to death. And Joseph warned by, by dream take, takes the family to Egypt. When the wicked arise, uh, men have to hide themselves. Verse 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses, and forsakes them, will have mercy. We know the story of David. David tried to cover his sin with Bathsheba. He tried to cover his murder of her husband Uriah, but it found him out, and he didn't prosper, and it caused him quite a bit of heartache in family and in kingdom, but God was merciful because David did eventually confess and forsake his sin, and God showed him mercy. I would say be quick to repent, confess, and forsake. And that's what true repentance is. True, true repentance is not just confessing, yeah, I sinned. True repentance is I have sinned and I am turning away from that sin. I'm forsaking that sin. I heard or I read this kind of cute little joke. An Irish, young Irishman, he... Um, he came to the priest in his village, and he said, Father, I have to make a confession. I, I stole two bags of potatoes from my neighbor. And the priest said, well, my son, I've already heard this news through the village. I commend you for coming and confessing to the crime. But it was only one bag of potatoes. To which the young man said, yes, Father, but I plan on stealing a second bag tonight. <laughs> He's confessing his sin, but he's not forsaking his sin. There is a difference. Verse 14. I'm going to circle back on this verse 13 a little bit later if we have time. Verse 14. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Reverence. Uh, it's a humility. There's a certain fear of the Lord in your heart, in your life. A respect for God for people, for the things of God. Happy is the man who is reverent, who's humble, who's walking in a sense of respect for others, self-control. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Verse 15, like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. A ruler who lacks understanding is a great oppressor. But he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. Leadership. Most of these proverbs written by Solomon, who was a king and leader of his land. He grew up under David's kingdom and leadership. He's a man who knew something about kingdoms, knew something about go governing authorities, knew something about leadership. And he speaks, and he's seen probably both. He's seen the wicked ruler, and uh, he's seen the man who also hates covetousness man who is not uh, in it for himself and his own gain. A lot of political leaders today seem to me to be very much in their own, after their own gain, their own purposes. And uh, I think that's true on both sides of political spectrums. But God calls us to think on those that would hate covetousness. Verse 17, a, a man burdened with bloodshed will flee into a pit. Let no one help him. Whoever walks blamelessly will be saved, but he who is perverse in his ways will suddenly fall. Again, sowing and reaping. A man burdened with bloodshed will flee into a pit. He's guilty of murder, and it brings consequence to his life. And the Scripture says don't help him. Uh, don't prevent the lessons of discipline. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't forgive a, a true, truly repentant heart. It doesn't mean that we can't be restored and reconciled. But it means that there does need, also need to be some sense of consequence and justice to a crime such as bloodshed, right? And, and we see that even in, even in our culture. There, you know, there's consequences to uh, living in rebellion and falling into sin. And we don't want to excuse those things, lest we have lawlessness, lest there be no accountability. 
So the scripture speaks clearly. Verse 19, he who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows frivolity will have poverty enough. Just practical, hard work. The Lord calling us to be diligent. If you till your land, you'll be blessed. God will provide. God has promised provision. Jesus said, don't worry about what you will eat, what you will wear. Your Father will provide. That doesn't mean you don't work, you don't till. It means that God will bless the work of your hand. And as you apply yourself diligently, God will faithfully provide. But he who follows frivolity will have poverty enough. Verse 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A faithful man, someone who's steady, someone who's patient, someone who, again, is uh, persuaded by your own bias, your own self-interest, then you become vulnerable to bribery because for a piece of bread, a man will transgress. If you're always under, you know, up for persuasion, depending on what's, good in, what's in it for you, then you are going to be vulnerable to transgressing for something very, you know, un, not worth it at all. So the warning. Verse 22, a man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. What is that evil eye in this case? I think it's covetousness. He wants to have wealth. He wants to be, he wants to, you know, have riches. And uh, he's hastening after it. He's, he's looking to, he's chasing it. It's, it's the passion of his life. It's an evil desire in his eye is looking on it. And he does not consider that poverty will come upon him. Those get-rich schemes uh, are just that. They're schemes. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The context of those words from Jesus are speaking against covetousness. If your eye is chasing after your own gain and covetousness, that's a darkness. And if that's the light that's in you, how great is the darkness? If that's what's driving you, a selfish pursuit of covetousness, that's the focus of your life, that's your eye's focus, then that's actually not seeing at all. It's blindness, it's darkness. Verse 23, he who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. That's a good one, isn't it? You can just kind of let that sit down in your heart. It's not easy to, uh, to hear a rebuke. How many of you can say amen to that? But sometimes we need a a correction, a loving rebuke, and uh, that'll find favor afterwards, after you're able to receive it, after you're able to to hear the truth of it. That's better than the one who flatters, who just gives you puffed up compliments, but they're not even sincere or true. That loving rebuke is better in the long run. You know, I was in the coffee shop uh, just visiting with some of our people there having a coffee. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, husband and wife walked in, and the husband had a real, he had a red eye, had, like he was rubbing his eye, and he says, you know, I got something in my eye. His wife spoke up, it's a plank. <laughs> so you see, a loving rebuke is a good thing. I won't give names, <laughs> but a little humor is not so bad either, you know. We laughed. Verse 24, whoever robs his father or his mother and says, it is no transgression, the same is companion to a destroyer. There is something about a son or daughter, a child that operates in presumption, a sense of entitlement. Um, I can take what's my father's or my mother's, it's no transgression, we're family, I'm going to get it in the end anyway. And this entitled a- attitude that is, uh, that is warned against here, that's, that's companion to a destroyer, someone that's uh, going to bring harm into your life. Ephesians 6, verse 1, 
Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. That's a commandment that has promise, that if you'll honor your father and mother, that God will watch over your life. It'll be well with you. You'll live long on the earth. There's a blessing for a child. Obey, obedience to the parents, for this is right. They do it in the Lord because parents aren't perfect. And parents they themselves are just fallen individuals. But that doesn't justify a disrespect. It doesn't justify not obeying the commandment of the Lord, which is to honor them to the best of our ability. We want to honor father and mother. Verse 25 He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. It seems that pride always brings strife. It seems that pride is always contending, always quarreling, always wanting position for itself. And he who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. There's a promise there that if you will humble yourself and allow God to promote you, allow God to defend you, allow God to prosper you, who's going to do a better job of getting your cause forward, you or the Lord? Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Do you want your life to be exalted? Not in a prideful, look at me sort of way, but to be blessed. Do you want to make progress? Do you want to come into the fullness of what God has for you? Humble yourself. Trust the Lord. You don't have to jockey for position. You don't have to contend with others in pride and, and try to, you know, step on one so you can get ahead. Let God promote you. Let God prosper you. Trust in the Lord that he may exalt you in, the, in, the, in due time. Verse 26, he who trusts in, in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. We're called not to trust in our own heart, our own wisdom, our own understanding. Scripture says in another place, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. The Scripture talks about um, not being wise in your own mind. Paul said it this way, he who thinks he knows something, let him know this, that he doesn't know anything. <laughs> When you start to think you know things, that's, that's a sure sign that you really don't know the, uh, the benefit and blessing of humility and just the honest evaluation of yourself. You're not as smart as you think you are. <laughs> uh, you're not as wise as you might imagine. You don't have all the answers. And the Scripture says here that even his own heart, you know, sometimes we, we justify things that that we believe are coming from our heart. Well, I know my heart. I know this is good because I feel it in my heart. It's what I believe it to do. But do you know that the heart can be deceptive? If the heart is being influenced by the Holy Spirit, if the heart is being guided by the Word and counsel of God, then you can follow your heart because the Spirit of God is leading your heart. But you have to recognize that not everything that you feel with all your heart is necessarily trustworthy or good. A lot of people get into trouble in relationships this way. I just, you know, I'm just in love. Your heart may feel that. And I'm not denying, I'm not, I'm not saying, I mean, those are powerful feelings of the heart. But can you just trust your heart in this or do you need to also consider the counsel of God and the, the leading of the Holy Spirit? And maybe even the counsel of others that know the Lord and would give good counsel because, because of this. Because your heart is so strongly you know, embracing something. So the warning, don't trust in your own heart. That's foolish. Walk wisely. And that's to walk in the counsel of God and His Word. 
The psalmist in Psalm 139, verse 23, knowing the tendencies of the heart, he said this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I don't believe this psalm would encourage us to walk around in the fear of guilt or worried about, you know, is there some evil thing in me? I think it's just an honest relationship with the Lord. Lord, you do know my heart, and I am asking you to search my heart. Show me my heart. You know, there's passages in the book of Acts where the apostles and the spiritual leaders, when they came together and prayed and sought the will of God, uh, Luke, the writer of Acts, he records it this way, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit to do these things. And so it, it seemed good to us. Our heart seemed right about it, but also we believe it also had the blessing of the Holy Spirit. That means they prayed. That means they consulted together. That means they waited on these things. And so we want our hearts, we want to be able to trust our hearts because I believe God leads us through the heart, that voice in our heart, the Spirit of God speaking to us in our heart, in our spirit. But we also have to recognize that I cannot trust in my own heart alone. I can only really uh, rely on the Lord guiding my heart when I've asked Him honestly to search it and to see if there's any wicked way in me. And let me tell you, you we, we are so clever in justifying what we want. I know it's the Lord. It must be the Lord. Well, you... Well, we've any famous last words? <laughs> make sure it's the Lord. Don't be anxious. Don't be. Don't make a decision foolheartedly. Do it patiently. Wait on the Lord. Don't trust in your own heart without the wisdom and counsel and the invitation of God to really search your heart. Verse twenty-seven: He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. Being sensitive to the needs of others around us, having generous hearts, generous hands, open lives. Paul would write this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So he who gives to the poor will not lack, is what the proverb says. Paul affirms that, that for those that are sowers, those that are generous with their resources, God fills their hands. It says that He's able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good work. When your heart is open, God can use your life. God can use your resources when, when He knows that, that you're not clinging to them for yourself. He who hides His eyes, He who doesn't consider the needs and the opportunities and really the stewardship that God has given to all of us, you know, there's, there's no taking it with you, as you know. You have resources that come through your hand, come to your life, some more than others, and it's, you know, it, it, we work hard and we do our best, but whatever you have, whatever you've accumulated, really those are things that God has entrusted you to hold during this lifetime. You're not taking it with you. So how you manage it is a stewardship. It's not yours. See, that's a hard thing for us to get through our mind. When we talk to married couples before they're married, we, we, we talk about this. Because, you know, you bring two lives together and they have different ideas about finances and how things should be prioritized. And what we try to introduce from the very beginning is recognize this, that everything you have is a stewardship from God. It's not yours. It's not hers. Well, that's mine. I made that. Oh, no, I worked hard for that. And these are true things. We do work hard, and we should have opportunity to, to 
direct those things that we've had opportunity to bring into our, our lives. But you understand the principle here. Recognize that even your ability to work, even your ability to, to accumulate wealth, even the blessings of, that many enjoy in this country especially, the wealth that we have, those things are stewardships and trust, that's a stewardship entrusted from God. And God will hold us accountable. How did you manage the resources that were entrusted to you? You know the parable. Jesus talking about the master who entrusted resources to three different servants, right? Ten, five, and three, or one, I can't remember the numbers. And the one with the most did duplicated that, and the one with the middle amount, he duplicated that, but the one who had the least, he hid it and buried it in the sand. But when the master came back, he said, here, I still have what was yours. Is that what the master wanted? Make sure you kept everything I gave you? Or to use it, to multiply it, to invest it, to, to take those resources and use them for the things of God. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. Last verse tonight, when the wicked arise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Boy, that's true. There have been wicked leaders and rulers over the centuries and generations, and there, are often, there have been hard times in, in various seasons, but they too perish, and the righteous have opportunity to increase. The comfort of knowing that Jesus will return and establish justice on the earth is really a wonderful truth, even in the midst of difficult times. Well, I want to close tonight, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And I want to pray for some of you here tonight, and I want to revisit verse 13 out of our text. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. How do we cover sin? Well, we sometimes sins are secret and we, we struggle to keep them secret. Sometimes sins are covered even in our own heart, even in our own eyes. We, we imagine that it's not what it, we, don't, we don't call it out for what it is. We're not willing to confess and acknowledge the problem. And that's not the way to spiritual prosperity, but whoever confesses and forsakes his sins will have mercy. And James, he says this in James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So uh, this is what's on my heart tonight. This verse stood out to me. Let me read it again. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Now, I'd like to pray for anyone here tonight that may be struggling with an issue of sin, some, some stronghold that the enemy has established in your life, some pattern that you've not been able to be free of. You've been covering it. You've been kind of keeping it below the radar Maybe even in your own conscience, you've been suppressing it. But it's not a way to spiritual prosperity. God wants to set you free. God wants you to acknowledge those things. Now, I'm not asking anyone to make a public confession of any specific sin here tonight. We don't want to come up and air any private laundry. But I am asking you to consider your heart tonight without getting into specifics, it, it may be something like this. I just know in my heart that I need to acknowledge that I'm struggling and I need prayer. Because the Scripture says, if you'll confess your trespasses one to another, if you'll be vulnerable, be willing to acknowledge and ask for prayer, because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And there are no righteous men in here in our own righteousness, but the body of Christ the people of God. This should be a safe place for us to say, hey, pastor, hey, congregation, please pray for me. I'm wrestling with something. Maybe it's, maybe it's anger. Maybe it's uh, some other trespass. I don't, I don't, I'm not asking for specifics. We don't want a list to, tonight. 
I just want an honest heart. And there may not be anybody that wants, feels compelled for this prayer. This will not be an easy thing to respond to because in so doing, you're acknowledging, hey, I'm, I'm struggling and I need prayer. It's the honest thing to do because he who confesses and forsakes his sin will find mercy. You see, God doesn't want you hiding things. God doesn't want things existing in the dark. He wants us to come to the light because the light is where there's mercy and forgiveness and help and change. And I've learned over the years, and we've prayed for many people over the years, we, we've dealt with many circumstances and different predicaments that people's lives end up in. And I know this even from my own Christian experience. There is something about the accountability of our brothers and sisters. There's something about acknowledging, I don't have it together. Hey, I need prayer. I want to get well. I want to be well. I want to walk in freedom. And there's something about that that actually helps break you free. You know, when you talk about uh, our one-step group, the men who, and women who meet on bi- regular reason for, in Bible study for, you know, trying to face up and deal with areas of addiction. There's something powerful in that when you're willing to acknowledge, hey, I, I need accountability in this area. I want prayer in this area. So we're going to sing. I want you to stand with me now and, and let's close in a song of, of worship. But if you're here tonight, and I'm asking you to be bold, but I'm not asking you to, to disclose anything other than what I've just mentioned. If you want prayer tonight, I'd love for you to just join me here at the altar as we sing. This will be your time to come forward and stand here, and we'll pray for you. And there may be others here tonight that you don't know the Lord. Come on up if you guys are ready. Those of you that want to come, come. There may be some of you that your first step and the reason you would come here tonight is just the acknowledgement that I, I, need, I need Jesus in my life. I'm struggling because I'm, I'm not even born again. I don't even know the Lord. And I'd love to pray for you too. And again, we're just going to pray and think there's something beautiful about prayer, something beautiful about honesty and being willing to acknowledge amongst our family here that we need help, we need the Lord's help. So let's sing, and those of you that have come, we'll pray in after we sing, but there may be more that need to come. Let's worship the Lord, and then we'll pray. And all things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone and things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again you cause your sun to shine
So Lord, we, we come forward tonight with uh, just an honest heart saying, we confess, Lord. We confess and acknowledge that we are struggling. And Lord, those that have responded are, are asking for not only mercy, not only forgiveness, but God also, as James said, as we confess our sins one to another, that we might be healed. Lord, we want to confess and we want to forsake. We're asking you for the power, the grace, and the help of your spirit to set us free from these patterns that are destructive in our lives, Lord. Sin that's entangling us, that's stealing away the good things that you desire to bring. Lord, we know you love us. We know your mercies are new every morning. But God, we're asking to be set free. Yes, forgiven, but healed. And so, Lord, for these that have come, Lord, I pray that just this coming forward will be such an act of faith, such a step of faith and honesty and sincerity that, Lord, it will, it will become powerful in their deliverance and setting them free tonight. And God, we're not judging, we're not looking, we're not trying to imagine, Lord, because all of us are here tonight and we need your mercies new every morning. All of our lives, Lord, fall short. All of us have things that plague us, God, thoughts and words and, and anxieties. And God, we pray tonight that you would meet your people with your mercy and with your love. And we pray that the resurrection power of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that you would quicken these mortal bodies, Lord. Help us to renew our minds, to set our course. And God, we just demonstrate that here tonight by faith. We ask you for your mercy. We ask you to, to set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you for coming forward tonight. All right. God bless you. Let's, uh, you guys can return to your seats. Let's sing that chorus one last time. Now listen, after the service, if anyone needs individual prayer, we have prayer, prayer counselors here available to pray with you. God bless you. Let's close this out with a song telling Jesus how much we love him. Jesus, we love you. we do love you. We thank you tonight just for the ministry of your word, the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray for such a blessing on your people tonight. I pray such a spirit of joy and refreshing would fill their hearts tonight, that there would be no condemnation, but just a sense of, of grace and, and love and embrace and reconciliation, Lord, having met with you, having acknowledged to you our need. The Bible says that if we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. We stand tonight cleansed and renewed and graced tonight. Bless your people, Lord. May there just be a spirit of joy, rest, and freedom. May this be the beginning, Lord. Lord, Revival begins with repentance. Spiritual life is, it meets weakness and honesty. Jesus, you were attracted to those that needed physician. 
And so, Lord, we are, we are good candidates for you tonight. We need you. We love you. We thank you that you love us. We pray, God, I pray just a blessing on your people tonight. May they go home with joy and thanksgiving in their hearts. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you.